Welcome to Beulah Presbyterian Church. And we would like to thank Nancy, Reverend Nancy Troy for leading us in worship today. On your announcements, you might want to be sure and read them. Uh, the daylight saving time, don't forget, it starts in two weeks. So you're going to want to set your clocks back one hour before you go to bed Saturday night. That's in two weeks. Uh, read about the college care. November 7th. Oh, November 7th. That's in one week. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Don't forget. Uh, the college care packages, you want to be sure and uh, read about that. Uh, and our donations for November for the Fern Creek Have United Ministries, uh, ravioli products and or toiletry items. You can leave them at the back of the church, back of the lobby, or you can take them to Fern Creek, um, the Havy Ministries right behind us. Please rise in body or in spirit and join me in the call to worship. We are people of God created to love. We will love the Lord our God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. We are people of God determined to love. We will love our neighbors and treat them as we would be treated. We love neither from a sense of obligation nor to gain popularity of favor. <clears throat> we choose to love both the lovely and the unlovable because love imitates God's nature. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You may be seated. Please join me in the call to confession and the prayer of confession as printed in your order of worship. The confession of our sin before God and one another reminds us that as individual believers and as a community of faith, we do stray or turn from the ways of love and justice. We believe that if we confess, we shall be forgiven and freed from the burden of guilt and empowered to carry on the ministry of Christ. With confidence in the mercy of God, let us pray together. Good and great God, we come to you through Jesus Christ, who intercedes for us. We confess our sins, seeking forgiveness, not only that we may be at peace with you, but also that we may pray for others. We are ashamed that our prayers are often as self-centered as our lives. Excuse our disordered priorities as we seek to change and reorder our lives according to the teaching and spirit of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. God sent Jesus not to judge us, but to save us. God accepts both our courage and our fears. In the name of Christ, our sins are forgiven. Dare to accept the gift of a new beginning. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the passing of the peace. God's love knows no bounds. Let us rejoice in the knowledge of that love by sharing the peace of Christ with one another. Peace be with you. And please be seated. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. <clears throat> Today's scripture is from Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 through 16. 
I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Jacob left Beersheba and went to Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to the heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie. I will give to you and to your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Well, this is quite a weekend. Today is Reformation Sunday, and tomorrow is All Saints Day. And let's not forget that Halloween is today, and even Halloween has some aspects, I guess you might say, or overtones to uh, spirituality. Although I'm not sure you have heard many sermons preached uh, about Halloween, so you'll get a little bit of that today. As our kids dress up tonight, and by the way, I brought my costume just in case the kids were here, but I think this is their Sunday that they visit another, another church. So you get spared from uh, seeing whatever my costume is. As our kids uh, dress up though tonight, in kind of scary sometimes, ghosts and goblins and skeletons, or superheroes, I think, are often seen um, when you open the door. Or sometimes there is a dreamlike fantasy uh, character. I think the princess probably takes um, that uh, particular uh, costume. It is sort of counter to the saints that we often lift up in memory on um, Monday this year. On both days, <clears throat> we seem to live right on the boundary, right on the boundary between the physical world and the spiritual world, the spooks and the saints, you might say. Now, in Ireland, Scotland, and England history, all Hell's not Eve was first a combination of both prayer and just some uh, celebration, some merriment uh, in, the, in the cities. And at that time, ch children would go door to door and they would uh, sing out this, soul, soul, an apple or two, if you haven't an apple, a pear will do, one for Peter, two for Paul, three for the man who made us all. Kind of makes our trick or treat kind of uh, weak, I think, when you uh, hear what they used to do so many uh, years, centuries ago. So that's my nod to today's celebration and tomorrow's day of remembrance, which we'll hear a little bit more about and in a nod to Reformation Day, I'm going to read uh, Psalm 46. Psalm 46 has some wonderful language 
about how far and wide uh, God is in the world today. It's kind of reminiscent of Luther and the hymn that many congregations will be singing today, although we still are not singing here in many congregations, even though there is, is a musician, they don't sing aloud either these days, um, but keep their masks on and sometimes uh, just hum along, hum along. Truth be told though, in deciding where I was going to go with today's sermon, where I could have chosen any one of these, I kind of knew from the get-go where I wanted to um, uh, go today, what I wanted to tackle um, and bring to you. It kind of goes along with that short hymn that I'm sure you have sung over and over again throughout the years, We Are Standing on Holy Ground. Remember those words? So easy. We are standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels all around. Let us praise Jesus now. We are standing in his presence on holy ground. So holy ground is kind of what I'd like to talk about today. And more specifically, the holy ground that some people talk in terms of thin places or thin moments in our lives. I'm hoping that can kind of tie my words together today. Thin places or, th or moments are where God's presence can be powerfully um, experienced, where the veil between heaven and earth kind of collapses, and we are so close to God. Or, as my sermon title suggests, it's when heaven and earth kiss. In the scripture that Barbara just read, we heard the story of Jacob, dream of a ladder that went from from earth to heaven, and the angels were descending and ascending. And he also heard the voice of God in his dream. God promised him land and family. And when he woke up, what did he say? He said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Surely. The Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Kind of sounds like a thin place to me, or sometimes we may call these thin places epiphany, when something happens that makes God's presence so powerful to us. Now, some of you may think that those biblical stories, those thin places, those epiphanies are something from the past. You know, we always tell the story of Moses and the burning bush, Jacob and his dream, um, and we can't forget the voice that came to Job through the whirlwind. And then there was Peter, James, and John who went to the mountaintop with Jesus. And what did they see? They saw two other entities with him and Jesus wrapped in blazing white, the power of presence, so close. It was so close to those disciples, remember, that they didn't want to leave the mountaintop. They said, we can build a place here. We can stay here, Jesus. We don't have to go down. No, no, Jesus said, we have to go down from that mountaintop. So those come from the past, and maybe we think that just couldn't happen. So let me give you a more contemporary uh, story. It's not biblical. It happened in our lifetimes. <clears throat> the Trappist monk, Thomas Merton, who's pretty famous around here, wrote about a mystical experience that he had in downtown Louisville. 
there is even a historical uh, plaque on that spot, which is very strange. You can imagine, usually it said, this is, what, this is what this building is, this is what history is. Instead, in Louisville downtown, we have a plaque that talks about that mystical experience that um, uh, Merton had. It's pretty unique. And this, these are his words that he wrote about. In Louisville, at the corner of Fourth and Walnut, so you can imagine that, you've probably been there at some time, in the center of the shopping district, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all those people, that they were mine and I theirs, that we could not be alien to one another even though we were total strangers. I suddenly saw the secret beauty in their hearts, the depths of their hearts where sin nor desire nor self-knowledge can reach. The core of their reality as a person uh, is in God's own eyes. If only, Merton said, if only, we could all, they could all see themselves as they really are. If only we could see each other the way, that way, all the time. And one of Merton's uh, basic um, texts, I guess, is that there is no division between earth and heaven. Everything is sacred ground even in the middle of uh, Louisville, Kentucky, on a street corner. A mystical adventure. Now, in my own experience, I have to say that I've kind of had a couple of those mysterious uh, times when the presence of God was so, so powerful. And perhaps you have also although Presbyterians don't often talk about that, but I will admit to two times. Um, <clears throat> one time happened when I was in bed and the evening was coming to an end and I was, was saying some uh, of my bedtime prayers and all of a sudden the presence of God was so right there I crawled out of bed, and I laid flat down on the floor. That's this, that's this, uh, the presence was so powerful to me. I just had to get down, um, and not even on my knees, flat as I kind of clung to the floorboards that night. And then there was another time. I was sitting in my dining room table, um, and there was a friend there, and I was telling him how excited I was about something that was happening in my corporate uh, job. And then all of a sudden, I said out loud, and then I'm going to quit that job and go to seminary. Now, literally, I turned around and said, who said that? Who said that? Now, I wasn't the only one that heard that. My friend said to me, Nancy, if you decide to go to seminary, and at the time I was a single mom with a child still at home, uh, to quit my job would have been uh, a terrible thing for me, I thought, financially. But he said, Nancy, I think that's a good idea. I think that's a good idea, and I'm willing to help support that if you choose to do that. I don't know why we have these experiences, but I knew, do know that I'm not alone in that. I have a book club, and they are all former retired Presbyterian ministers, women, and I guess we know enough that we can say some of those things aloud. Presbyterians, I think, are probably uh, are a little bit hesitant to talk about these things 
Maybe because we are a bit afraid to be captured by the Holy Spirit, because who knows? Who knows where the Holy Spirit um, is, is going in our lives and the lives of others? And I suspect maybe some of you have had some kind of an experience when it kind of went beyond just the normal, and all of a sudden, God was there. God was there for you. So with that unusual introduction, I know, listen to the words of Psalm 46, words that I do think speak of God's awesome presence with us and with the world today. <clears throat> God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. God enters a voice and the earth melts. The God of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolation the Lord has brought to the earth. God makes war cease to the end of the earth and breaks the bow and shatters the spear. God burns the shields with fire. Be still. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted on the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Well, in an unlikely place to find some spiritual materials, I read the New York Times, um, uh, maybe not cover to cover, but I am a devotee to the times. And back in 2012, the travel uh, author wrote a piece about going to thin places. And he actually meant places, not the moments that I just described. But he said, you can take a tour to these thin places. And he wrote, I'm drawn to places that beguile and inspire, sedate and stir, places where for a few blissful moments, I loosen my death grip on life and can breathe again. It turns out that these destinations have a name, thin places. <clears throat> they are places where the distance between heaven and earth collapse and we're able to catch a glimpse of the divine, or the transcendent, or as I like to think of it, the infinite whatever. Now remember, this is a travel uh, person speaking in those words. And he continues, he says, travel to thin places does not necessarily lead to anything as grandiose as a spiritual breakthrough, whatever that means, but it does disorient, it confuses, we lose our bearings, and we find new ones, or not. Either way, we are jolted out of our old ways of seeing the world, and therein lies the transformative magic of travel. That from a very secular, um, not biblical source. It is clear, it is unclear, I should say, that um, who would have ever thought of that turn? Who, who actually uttered thin places in the beginning? But, but um, he said in his article later on, they clearly had an Irish 
or a Scottish brogue. It had to come from there. And in truth, the ancient pagan and Celts, and later the Christians, used the term to describe these places, like, like the Isle of Iona, or the uh, rocky peaks of the mountains over there, um, where heaven and earth, the Celtic saying goes, are only three feet away. But these thin places, even come make it thinner. Now, when my husband Bruce and I went to Scotland, we visited the Isle of Iona, where many people believe is probably the most celebrated place of a thin place, where people go to the Isle and maybe attend one of their worship services, or for me, I was able to walk freely in someone's um, farm uh, yard, very close to the animals, and I thought, Nancy, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? But you want to explore there and find out why it is that people actually experience God as very close to them at that time. Bruce found that those stone um, structures that you can still see in the British Isles, um, that you, sometimes you can walk right into, uh, they may have been barrier grounds, they may be worship or gathering for the community, but he could feel that closeness to God there, even more than on the Isle of Iona. On that island, there is an abbey and they have regular church services, and they have, a, they have established a community around the world, really, that follows um, what they uh, have created as worship that gets us a little bit deeper into the presence of God. There are only 150 full-time residents on that island, but there is a community of about 240 members, 1,500 associate members, and 1,500 friends who are committed to rebuilding the Earth's common life through working for social and political change, striving for the renewal of the church with an ecumenical um, emphasis, and exploring new, more inclusive approaches to worship. That's quite a following. The travel author ends his article with these words. The divine supposedly transcends time and space, yet we seek it in very specific places and at very specific times. If God, however you define it, he says, is everywhere and every when, is how the Australian Aboriginals uh, define it. Why are only some places thin? Why aren't all places thin? Maybe the world is thin. Maybe it is because we are just too thick to experience how thin heaven and earth come together. So are you and me too thick to recognize when we see heaven and earth kiss and give us that wonderful glimpse of the divine? Are we too busy or too distracted to not see God in all the places, in our homes, in this place where you worship, out walking? Are we too thick to see these thin places? Well, Jacob woke from his dream and he said, surely, Surely the God is in this place, and I did not know it. The psalmist 
wrote, Be still and know that I am God. The Lord of hosts is with us. And you might remember in the letter of the Hebrews that we are told that we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. We are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Thin places. Maybe we don't need a travel agent to get to these places. Maybe we just need to be aware that every place is blazing with God's glory. May that be true for you as it is for me. Amen. <clears throat> Let's turn now and affirm our faith. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Please be seated. <clears throat> So let's gather our thoughts and dig deep into our hearts and come to God in prayer. God of all the saints, the living and the dead, we come before you in prayer this morning and ask that we might be your holy people prepared to give of ourselves for the work and the service of, of the world that you love. <clears throat> we are grateful for the saints who have nurtured us in the past, who taught and mentored us to be your faithful people today. God of grace, loosen the grip that hatred and cruelty that uh, have on some human hearts, bring solace to the weary, comfort and shelter to the vulnerable, freedom to the oppressed, mercy to the guilty, and love to the lonely and the isolated. God of compassion, bring healing and peace to the nations in conflict, where there is political instability and where COVID still rages through the population. Protect those who are poor and hungry and give them hope. Move those with plenty to share with those who have little and help all people to love their neighbor as themselves. Creator God, we thank you for all the ways that your beautiful creation provides and cares for us Yet so often we are careless stewards of that creation. Rather than a precious gift, we so often see the earth as disposable and made just for our own consumption. We pray for world leaders as they gather in conference this week to discuss how to honor your creation for those who will come after us. May we and our leaders put aside personal motives and political agendas to work together to find ways to live together in peace, respecting each and every person as a child of God. We pray for this church during this time of transition that their road ahead is where you are leading, that with confidence they can move into the future where you are leading them and cling to the promise that you are always, always with them. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray. 
<clears throat> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. <clears throat> and now we go out where God intends us to go. God is not staying here in this building. God is going with each and every one of us. But practice, practice this week a bit of noticing everything that your eyes are set upon. Practice seeing it as what God is giving and what we need to be thankful for. Because we know that the God who created us, Jesus Christ who redeemed us, and the Holy Spirit, don't be afraid of that spirit, works in and among us all. Go in peace. Go with God. Amen.